are stories, <laughs> legends really, of the steady job. Old timers gather graduates around the flickering light of a computer monitor and tell stories of how the company used to be, back when a job was for life, not just for the business cycle. In those days, there were dinners for employees who racked up 25 years. Don't laugh, you. Yes, 25 years of service. In those days, a man didn't change jobs every five minutes. When you walked down the corridors, you recognized everyone you met. Hell, you knew the names of their kids. The graduates snicker. A steady job. They've never heard of such a thing. What they know is the flexible job. It's what they were raised on in business school. It's what they experienced too as they drove a cash register or stacked shelves between classes. Flexibility is where it's at, not dull, rigid, monotonous steadiness. Flexible jobs allow employees to share in the company's ups and downs. Well, not so much the ups, but when times get tough, it's the flexible company that thrives. By comparison, a company with steady jobs hobbles along with a ball and chain. The graduates have read the management textbooks and they know the truth. Long-term employees are so last century. The problem with employees, you see, is everything. You have to pay to hire them and pay to fire them, and in between, you have to pay them. They need business cards, they need computers, they need ID tags and security clearances and phones and air conditioning and somewhere to sit. You have to ferry them to off-site team meetings, you have to ferry them home again. They get pregnant, they injure themselves, they steal, they join religions with firm views on when it's permissible to work. Then when they read their email, they open every attachment they get, and when they write it, they expose the company to enormous legal liabilities. They arrive with no useful skills, and once you've trained them, they leave. And don't expect gratitude. If they're not taking sick days, they're requesting compassionate leave. If they're not gossiping with coworkers, they're complaining about them. They consider it their inalienable right to wear body ornamentation that scares customers. They talk about, dear God, unionizing. They want raises. They want management to notice when they do a good job. They want to know what's going to happen in the next corporate reorganization. And lawsuits. The lawsuits. They sue for sexual harassment, for an unsafe workplace, for discrimination in 32 different flavors, for, get this, wrongful termination. Wrongful termination! These people are only here because you brought them into the corporate world and suddenly you're responsible for them for life? The truly flexible company, and the textbooks don't come right out and say it, but the graduates can tell that they want to, doesn't employ people at all. This is the siren song of outsourcing, the seductiveness of the subcontract. Just try out the words. No employees. Feels good, doesn't it? Strong, healthy, supple. Oh yes, a company without employees would be a wondrous thing. Let the workers suck up a little competitive pressure. Let them get a taste of the free market. The old timer stories are fairy tales, dreams of a world that no longer exists. They rest on the bizarre assumption that people somehow deserve a job. The graduates know better. They've been taught that they don't. Max Berry is an Australian satirist who, as of 2015, has published five novels, Syrup, Jennifer Government, Company, Machine Man, and Lexicon. He focuses on the major themes of business, ethics, marketing, with occasional forays into more traditional fairs such as science fiction and politics. For our purposes, we will be talking primarily about Jennifer Government and Company, as those two have the most relevance to the topics under discussion in this class. Although it's worth mentioning that Barry's first novel, Syrup, while also related to the business world, is more about marketing and how image can be easily manipulated to get people to buy whatever it is you're selling. Especially if you can market your product under the right name and logo. Oh, by the way, Syrup was made into a movie which is available on Netflix at the present time, although the actual events in the film vary wildly from those in the novel, but the basic concepts are still the same. We're actually going to work backwards and start with company. The premise of company is as follows. Stephen Jones gets a job working at Zephyr Holdings in Seattle. However, as he settles into his new job, he notices that even for a modern corporation, a lot of the things that Zephyr does make no sense. From the plot summary on Amazon.com. Stephen Jones is a shiny new hire at Zephyr Holdings. From the outside, Zephyr is just another bland corporate monolith, but behind its glass doors, business is far from usual. The beautiful receptionist is paid twice as much as anybody else to do nothing, the sales reps use self-help books as manuals, no one has seen the CEO, no one knows exactly what they're selling, and missing donuts are the cause of office intrigue. While Jones originally wanted to climb the corporate ladder, he now finds himself descending deeper into the irrational rationality of company policies. What he finds is hilarious, shocking, and utterly telling. Eventually, Jones takes the initiative and bucks every authority to find out exactly what it is that Zephyr actually does. 
This leads him to be inducted into the ranks of Alpha, a cabal of Zephyr employees led by CEO Daniel Klausman, who are actually responsible for Zephyr's real purpose. The entire company is a test bed for management techniques. Zephyr has no actual customers. All the sales are done internally between departments. Each Alpha member decides on something they want to study in the business world, implements the structure necessary for the experiment, and then observes the results. Those results which fall in line with Alpha's goals, we're not big on that whole work-life balance thing, says Klausman, are incorporated into the actual end product, the Omega Management System, which includes such cutting-edge insights as this. Companies that require a doctor's certificate in all circumstances experience 6% fewer sick days than companies that do not require a certificate. This translates into a productivity gain of 0.4% for the average Fortune 500 company. 0.4% and the point that Barry is making with this is that somewhere along the road, companies lost sight of the fact that workers are actual human beings with lives outside their jobs. For some reason, it became more about the bottom line and not about having content employees. Klausman and the rest of Alpha firmly believe this, and after Jones decides to take a stand against the indignity Zephyr employees have been suffering, resulting in, amongst other things, getting all of senior management to resign, Klausman makes it quite clear what Alpha thinks of the idea that happy and content workers are more productive. Jones, we are not amateurs. Alpha did not assume that cutting employee benefits raises productivity. We studied it. We tried it both ways. We tried it in ways you haven't thought of yet. And that's why we know letting employees run the company is a bad idea. Does Zephyr have high turnover and poor morale? Yes. Do its employees complain a lot? Yes. Would it be more successful if it addressed these problems? No. Because at that level, happy employees are not more productive. People don't become receptionists and sales assistants because they love answering phones. And if you give them the opportunity to earn the same salary by working less, you know what? They grab it. This is not a principle Alpha invented because we enjoy being assholes. It is a fact. Maybe you don't like it, maybe we don't like it, but we understand it and we manage it. You, Jones, don't understand it. You took a high but manageable level of employee dissatisfaction and turned it into a rebellion because you believe in a goddamn fantasy. Now, I want to make it clear that Barry is not anti-business. He approaches the satire of the business world with the attitude of someone fascinated by the culture it has created. What he's pointing out through his work is the extremely strange attitudes and downright sociopathic behavior that seems to generate in an office environment. Holly, one of the characters in Company, even notes that she's not the same person at work that she is when she leaves for the day, and that she knows almost nothing about her co-workers' lives outside of the office. How many of us have been in that same position? So let's extrapolate and backtrack to Barry's second novel, Jennifer Government. This is the map of the world of Jennifer Government. The premise of this novel is very simple. At an unspecified point in the near future, the corporations have taken over an all but name in those countries controlled by the United States. So much so that your last name is the name of the company you work for. How many of you just looked at the name tags on the table in front of you just now trying to work that out? In Jennifer Government, capitalism has run amok. Everything is for sale and everything is incorporated. Even basic services like the police and emergency services. Hell, even the NRA is a corporation. Which means that when a crime is committed, the victim or victim's families must pay for the investigation and arrest of the perpetrators, regardless of whether it's the police or the government doing the investigation. As you can imagine, this means that corporations can get away with a lot in the name of making money. We're talking situations where the term hostile takeover can involve assault weapons. The novel gets the ball rolling when hapless merchandising officer Hack Nike is approached by John Nike and John Nike from marketing. One of the Johns is an operative who gets things done, the other is the main antagonist of the story, John Nike, VP of Guerrilla Marketing. John's new campaign for the new Nike Mercuries is based on the sad trend of ghetto kids killing each other for their shoes. John has been deliberately withholding the sale of Mercuries to only a few pairs, which, by the way, retail for about a thousand bucks per pair, until he's ready to dump the rest in the market and cause a buying frenzy. But to avoid losing the impact of denial of sales he's been getting, he has a plan to kick the Mercury campaign into high gear. Kill 10 random upper class purchasers of the shoes. And Hack is the poor sap who gets roped into being the trigger man. Hack, uncertain of what to do, goes to the police who let him know that if he goes through with it, if the families of the victims pay for the investigation, he will most likely be caught and imprisoned. On the other hand, if he doesn't go through with it, he would be in breach of contract with Nike, which would expose him to whatever penalties that would entail which probably would start with him being fired and then get worse. Option three is that Hack could subcontract the job out to the police, which he does having no other option. Things get out of hand when the police subcontract the job to the NRA and a panic breaks out at a mall in Melbourne when the killings start. 
One of the victims is a schoolgirl named Haley McDonald. And this entire operation comes to the attention of our title character, Jennifer Government, who suspects John's involvement, and this leads into a plethora of people being roped into John's attempts to clean up the mess and his latest scheme to grab power and influence in the business world. Not unsurprisingly, things get out of hand, and it's while John's being called on the carpet by a consortium of corporate interests all involved in the US Alliance Customer Loyalty Program that Barry's most searing indictment against the profits before people corporate mindset is revealed, delivered by John Nike himself, the epitome of what is wrong with that kind of mindset. Okay then, three points. One, the government is not going to arrest us. They tried in London and failed. Now you can bet they weren't going to pack up their toys and go home. They were going to try again and again and again until they'd gotten us. But now, thanks to me, they've lost half their executives. They've lost their ability to coordinate, at least for a while. The government is not going to arrest us because the government is no longer able to. Two, there will not be a consumer boycott. The public will not suddenly start buying Whoppers instead of Big Macs or Apples instead of IBMs. Trust me, I'm from Nike. Nobody actually swaps brands because they heard the company did something bad. They keep on buying their favorite product at their favorite price. Yes, there is going to be a media backlash, but there is not going to be a consumer backlash. Three, yes, some people died. But let's not pretend these are the first people to die in the interests of commerce. Let's not pretend there's a company in this room that hasn't had to put profit above human life at some point. We make cars we know some people will die in. We make medicine that carries a chance of fatal reaction. We make guns. I mean, if you want to expel someone here for murder, let's start with the Philip Morris liaison. We have all at some time put a price tag on human life and decided we can afford it. No one in this room has the right to sit here and pretend my actions came out of the blue. Look, I'm not designing next year's ad campaign here. I'm getting rid of the government, the greatest impediment to business in history. You don't do that without a downside. Yes, some people die, but look at the gain. Run a cost-benefit analysis. Maybe some of you have forgotten what companies really do, so let me remind you, they make as much money as possible. If they don't, investors go elsewhere. It's that simple. We're all cogs in wealth creation machines. That's all. I've given you a world without government interference. There is now no advertising campaign, no intercompany deal, no promotion, no action you can't take. You want to pay kids to get the swoosh tattooed on their foreheads? Who's going to stop you? You want to make computers that need repair after three months? Who's going to stop you? You want to reward consumers who complain about your competitors in the media? You want to pay them for recruiting their little brothers and sisters to your brand of cigarettes? You want the NRA to help you eliminate your competition? Then do it. Just do it. I think too many people in business today rely on nonfiction books like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Rich Dads Who Move Cheese and spurn fiction because they believe it has nothing to offer them in terms of their careers. As you can see, Max Berry has proven that maybe, sometimes, we need to see the absurdity of what we're doing before we can start to make it better. Because sometimes, the best way to get someone to see the nightmare is to make them laugh at it.